go. So we're talking about heads in perspective, and we're going to talk about deep perspective. Let's do uh, this deep perspective. Not radically so, but significantly so. Now, when we start talking about deeper and deeper perspective, a, the oldest and simplest form of, of designing structure, because we can stack things and we can stack things two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally, right? But even more simply and more effectively, we can overlap them, eclipse them like a moon over the sun or whatever. So as soon as we get one thing in front of the other, then that creates instant depth, layers of reality. So overlaps become really important. And we, when we get into deeper and deeper perspective, the long axis shortens. And that's why it's called foreshortening. We have a tube. And it doesn't even look like a tube in flat perspective if we could have a truly flat perspective. It's only when we see it in a little bit of dynamic position do we start to see its true character and its kind of provenance. But if we get into super deep perspective, we start losing that character again. Is that a circle or is that the end of a tube? Is it two little circles, one behind the other? We start to lose that idea. So deep, deep perspective starts to distort things. Things look f smaller and much shorter than they might really be. I got a kitty cat talking to me about my feet. Um, so keep that in mind. We're going to use that deep perspective. Hang on, I'm going to put the kitty out. Come here. Come here, buddy. I'm babysitting him because his, uh, his mommy's out of town. Uh, so anyway, deep perspective, we're going to use that. So with that in mind, let's go back to our earlier strategy. We have the LTL, L, T, and then another L. And that gives us the length, width, and the depth. It sets all the major corners up so then we can just ex excuse me, extrapolate and get that boxy construction of whatever we're drawing, in this case, a head. So LTL. But even simpler than that, because when I always like to have an out, and so I'm always thinking when in doubt, if I'm having trouble, the process is confusing. If the information is overwhelming. If the uh, thing I'm trying to draw is too complex, when in doubt, I simplify. I'll try and make it even simpler. Simplify. Don't help me. I can spell that. So the simplest way to approach things in my mind is simply the ear in relationship to the eyebrow line and probably the center line too. Because when we get that, we got less over here, more over here, we start to get that foreshortening. And we have something, a simple construction line on the front of the face, so on the front of the box. And then going back from somewhere along that eyebrow, I usually use the arch if there is one. I don't have really much of an arch there. I was born without an arch. Uh, now we have something on the side. If we can get the front in relationship to the side, that again is box logic and it starts to give us exactly what we need to put something in three-dimensional perspective. So the ear is the only major feature on the side of the head, very valuable. And if we start moving the position of that ear, because in a perfectly placed profile, call that PPP, I guess, the ear sits very close without the features. 
very close to the middle of the head, the front of the ear. It sits roughly at the center line of the head, close enough for us. And it's very close to the middle, not just front to uh, side to side, but top to bottom. It's very close to the bottom of it. So it's kind of plunked right in the middle, especially that sideburn area or in between there on, on our um, shot of J.C. Leyendecker. So now if I simply draw my simple yet characteristic way of drawing the face and the skull, and it can be all sorts of ways, but this is my way, I almost always use, I simply have to take that ear that sits in this middle and move it closer. And now I'm getting getting the idea that we're behind the head. I can't see the T here. I only see part of the L. But even then, when I've lost the LTL, just the placement of the ear sets it really nicely in space by moving it closer or farther away from the front of the face to the back of the head, side to side. But also we can do it top to bottom. Let's see here. So let's do it again. I'm simply comparing this to a grid, but I'm curving the lines. This is quite vertical, but it curves. This is quite horizontal, but it curves. And now I'm going to bring that ear closer, or keep it, in this case, closer to the front of the face. And I'm going to screw up in the right way when I make my decisions. I'm going to, since I want to show the head turning away, I'm going to make it a little too close, because if I make it a little closer, it's going to turn a little farther away. So I'll make it a little closer, just to be safe. It's a better mistake to make. And I'm going to drop it a little lower. So rather than being right in line with my eye line, I'm not sure why that ear ended up there, but it did. I don't know who did that. There's my eyebrow eye socket. In this case, it drops down a little bit. Now, some of that is particular character and position of the ear. Some of that's that we're getting just a little bit on top of this head. And if we think of it as a box, even though it's not at all a box, then it becomes easy to find the corners. And when we find the corners, we find the three-dimensional form. Form and structure is about corners. The more corners, the more structure. And that's why shadow shapes are so powerful, because they're a value representation of corners. But as soon as we do that, we get a lot of uh, bang for our buck, just by being very conscious of the ear. And as we then add our simple yet characteristic and our ever smaller and ever more characteristic details, then we can build this out in a wonderfully precise way, if we were going to take the time to be precise, and a uh, very efficient way, quite quick. And notice now we're using our old friend. We're not using the LTL. It's not there. But we're using just half an L, just a... Uh, um, eyebrow to ear relationship gets closer to the eyebrow, gets lower than the eyebrow. Just by doing that, we've gotten a ton of value, a ton of info. And we're using our, well, our friend that we just mentioned a few minutes ago, overlaps. The cheek and eye socket are in front of the eye cheek and eye socket and eye are front of the nose. The wing of the nose and the cheek, and in this case specifically, 
that um, masseter muscle allows us to chew, to masticate masseter. And now the lower lip is overlapped a little bit by the upper lip, the jowl area is overlapping the chin and digastric plane and neck are overlapped by the collar, the collar by the, the schmock, the smock, and so on. See how efficient and how wonderful those overlapping ideas are? We get very quickly to what we're after. And we get those big, simple ideas, and we do it as simple as possible. And when it starts to get too complicated, we make it simpler yet. <clears throat> so, the ear is a powerful tool. And if we look at that in all sorts of different positions, let's see here if we make that a little bigger. And it's a, a bit of a drag that there's a hat, but it's also an opportunity to, to see that we're a little underneath this head because we can see the brim of the hat. And notice I'm overdoing the underneathness. I'm screwing up to deeper, more dynamic perspective. And now if we replace this tube line with a more curved idea. And then if we find the eyebrow eye socket and notice how that eye socket gets more and more narrow. If we're um, on a true profile, we'll see quite a deep eye socket. Look how deep that is. But now we're just getting a bare indentation. And look how close that ear gets and how high that ear gets. And the ear is a C shape, or if it's you see a little bit of the back of it, of it, you can think of it as a. I can draw here. You can think of it as a disc. And if we get way behind it, we're just seeing the th the uh, thickness of the disc. So you can actually just do that. If you're seeing a little bit of the side, you can loop it around a little bit of the back side, you can loop it around this way, and you'll see a little bit of the bowl to the rim, very much like a, a um, Boy Scout cap or any kind of male hat oftentimes has that, or I guess female too, has that brim action going, and you'd want that to uh, line up with <clears throat> with the skull and forehead and such. And we'll, we'll keep it up high so, so we can see a little bit more. So just by getting that much closer, and you can see how simple the design is. This is Lion Decker. Really simple stylized. But just by placing that ear closer, and higher, we now know we're underneath. And we start to get uh, rather quickly the um, effect we're after. Okay, so pay attention to that. Start looking at ears. Now, if we get way, just checking time, we're doing pretty good. 
if we get way underneath, let me see uh, if we have many people coming in. We got started late that we had a little bit of a glitch. Um, whoops. That's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. Yeah, a bunch of you are in good. Glad you made it. Sorry we had a little, little uh, kerfuffle trying to get things up and going early enough to let you in. So we probably were missing a few, so I apologize to them. Um, so if we now look at a view where we're straight on, we touched on this a little bit last week, and we're not going to touch on it fully this week either, but I'm going to give a few, a few basic points around it. When we're straight on and underneath, now we're seeing all face and no skull. We're going to spend time with whatever time we have left today. We might uh, It'll spill over into tomorrow, uh, next time. But uh, we're going to look at the top view where the skull overwhelms the face. So it's a lot of skull. You can't see much of the face. When we're straight on and or straight on and underneath, we're seeing very little of the skull and all face. And that's what we have here with this Dean Cornwell. We have this lovely, just bullet shape for this man's head, this priest who's hanging out, a little bored, it looks like. It's because he's not an artist. Wouldn't be bored if that was a sketchbook in his lap. And what we'll notice is two things that we'll just, I'll just call out. We get to see the T now. And here's eye sockets. We'll just do that like he's got uh, goggles on or something. We're seeing just a little bit of skull. The skull cap comes down into the forehead. We're seeing a little bit of the, uh, the skull outside the mask of the face here. In fact, it's tracking down the shadow. Down here, this is kind of skull, this is kind of face, kind of bit. <clears throat> and well, there's two things we're going to see here. I'm just going to do this. Draw that little chin there. We'll notice that we're getting to see, and because he's got such a, a thick neck and a soft jawline, we're not seeing it really well on this reference. But uh, it's a beautiful job of an illustration, but it's not a beautiful choice of what I want to talk about. So I'm going to change it a little bit. We'll see the digastric plane. We're now seeing underneath this a little bit. And it's really important that it's just this waddle area. It's where we go from chin to throat. It's really important we see that when we can see it. Because it keeps the face, just like the eye socket helps quite a bit. It keeps the face from looking like a, Hall a cheap Halloween mask. There's a little bit of that LTL as it goes down to the far eye socket that we can't quite see, but we can see a little bit of the eyebrow, let's say. And as soon as we get a little bit of that digastric plane, Now we're getting volume, and the more we give, the better we get in terms of a real structure. So we want to feel that plane when we can see it, because it, it gives us solidity. What it's doing here is showing us, again, 
the underside of a bucket idea, of a tube idea, right in here. It's just rounded off in a bit of a bullet shape. Just a bullet form of that same bucket idea. So if we give it a box head like a Dick Tracy character might have. We're going to be in pretty good shape. Same here. And we can see that bucket analogy here too. Like so. It's just that the bottom of the bucket is a beveled underside. It's sliced at a bevel right there right there, like so. Okay, the other thing we'll see is the ears in relationship to the eyebrow or eyebrow line, and you could do the eye line if you wanted, I like the eyebrow line, is very low. And so when we look right across, we'll see the ears, the top of the ears are down by the lower lids. And it's really easy to miss that. Put in those ears low. If we're looking at our figure this way, The ear is right in line with the eyebrow line as we look at it. But if the head looks, let's do it this way. If the uh, head lifts up, then the ear is going to seem low. lower. So that's what's happening here. We'll also notice oops, here's a Solomon J. Solomon piece, uh, Ajax and um, Cassandra. You'll notice on here instead of a tube we could do an egg. Either one's fine. But we want to be underneath the egg, just like we're underneath the tube. And there's that T again. There's that digastric plane again. There's the low, although we can't see this one, the low ears again, even more extreme. And if we pick up the eye socket, we start to see all sorts of trouble brewing for us. That we're going to have to solve at some point, but not today. And if we don't really pay attention to it, and oftentimes if we're not told about it, we'll assume, we'll assume this. And when it does this, you know it best this way. You're going to end up distorting and usually lessening that perspective and screwing things up somehow or another. First one happens with the ears. We assume they're up here, so you'll, you'll do this. I'm underneath this head, and then you'll put the ears up here. And you won't. it'll take you a while to figure out what's right. Usually you take a break and look back at horror with your coffee of what you've done. So as soon as that natural, ordinary, less dynamic, rather boring position that we're so used to, flat plane, breaks that flat plane, we don't have the bandwidth to understand that because it's not it's a non-ordinary reality. We, we don't come across it much, if at all. And then it gives us trouble. Again, we might see just a little bit of skull, or in this case, a little bit of the hairstyle that hides the skull. And 
And notice how close the nose or uh, nose the nose or the nose is to the um, eye line. Here's the eyes with the lids in there. Just uh, do that with the uh, heroic, although he's doing anything but being a heroic here as he steals his four woman away. Her temple in this case. But notice how close the bottom of the nose is to the eye line. If you look that way, it was just that way. So one of the problems we're going to have when we're drawing the head in these uh, these different deep perspectives, we're going to have havoc is going to be played with all of our prop our proportions. Yes. And that's because if we look again at a profile, here right in the middle, audience taking a look, we'll see the forehead. Let's uh, do it here. We'll have the forehead coming out, forehead into the eye socket going back in. That's why it's shadowy here. Nose coming out, going back in. Upper lip coming out, going back in. Lower lip coming out, going back in. Chin coming out, going down and back in. Neck going back one way or another. And so as this poor young artist takes a look, she sees all of these things in foreshortened perspective. The nose is already foreshortened. Even as you look at me straight on eye to eye, it's already foreshortened a little bit. And if I do this even a little bit, it radically foreshortens. If I do this, it actually gets longer. So when we're in these non-ordinary positions, the nose gets shorter, the eyebrow, oh, not the eyebrow, the underside, top side of the eye socket gets longer. Look how deep that is. Look how much clearance there is. That's because we're seeing fuller flatter perspective. So it goes a little crazy on us and it takes us a while to work that out. And then this is all going to be digastric plane under here. So keep that in mind. We've got some work to do on that, that front, but we'll save that for another time. Now with a few minutes we have left, let's start our mission here of Starting to understand the on top as it's called technically. Uh, I don't need to do that. So any, any of those three quarter front views, we're going to get that nice LTL we can use. So let's do that. Get a little prettier color here. There's the L. I could draw a three-dimensional version of my sailboat if I wanted to. There's so lots of different ways you can do it. You, you experiment, find yours. I could just do this and then pick up the eyebrow line, comparing these things to a grid. I notice it drops down here. This is, I'm not gonna look at the nose, that sticks out. Look at the face going back a little bit three-quarter view. You know, those fun kind of caricatured eyebrows there. Notice I've changed this now five times, just taking my time, being patient to see how far it goes in. So let's just do a little bit of the eye socket, kind of the shaded part of that. And sometimes I'll draw in the smaller structures so I can make sure 
Notice I squared this out a little bit more. That's that L idea. But also, let's, let's do a little bit of that wispy hair. I look more and more like this little guy every time I draw him <laughs> as I think about it. Uh, but I can now break this into smaller pieces to check my proportions. Here's the uh, nose down here. The upper lip and mustache are well under the nose. I'm just going to draw that stuff instead. And we'll just do that. <clears throat> and now, after all that time, I'm going to do the, that was all off the T to make sure I can find the chin so I can find the rest of the body if I need to. But I could have right away, and maybe even should have right away. You'll decide that as you play with these things. Now, I'm not seeing this much of the ear, but I'm going to draw what I imagine it to be, even though I'm going to cover it up, so I can get a feel for it. And I'm going to use, again, the lesser structures, the eyebrows, the kind of temple area and the hair line, sideburn area. And that's going to give me a relatively simple way of tracking where that ear is. And quite often when I add some of that, that uh, lesser stuff, I'll find I screwed it up. One of the reasons I'll draw light, I'm drawing a little darker than I might otherwise, so you guys can see it. So I blame you guys for this not being a perfect drawing. So. There we go. Okay, so now see how I've placed that. I took my time relatively, and then as I get more of the lesser things, I can correct the bigger things. So I'm juggling. <clears throat> I worked out the biggest possible idea or the front structures and proportioned positions of the lesser things. <clears throat> and then every time I get a new bit of information, I compare it to everything else, making sure each is in the relationship. Now I can reassess, correct, refine, and problem solve. And work that out. There's another way to do that, though. And you might find this easier. You might find it's not as easy. So I'll play with it. <clears throat> and I'll bounce back and forth with it, just depending. But when I get a uh, position, profile, back three quarter, back view, front view, doesn't matter too much, but where the head is tipped down substantially, and you'll decide what substantially is, then instead of going to all this, I'll go to the overlap. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me do this real quick. And that overlap means I'm just going to draw, let's take this and do a little more conventional way of drawing that profile three quarter or not of the head. Most people would do this. They draw some kind of egg. Loomis actually draws a perfect circle, which I never quite understood. It works for him. It doesn't seem to work for other people too well because it drops that skull too low and gives you <clears throat> a lollipop look, unless it's a heroic figure with a nice, thick, masculine neck, which is what he always draws, 
or a beautiful woman with a bobbed or long flowing hairstyle to cover that neck. But the back of the skull, this is a nuchal point where the base of the skull has a little ducktail to it, and that's where the attaching erector muscles of the neck under the trapezius hold that head upright. What you'll find on most people where the skull meets the neck, it's very close to the eye or eyebrow line. somewhere in there, where Loomis puts it, it puts it way down at the nose sometimes. So I'm going to draw this. I want to make sure I get it egg-like and not uh, uh, circular. And then I'm going to, let's just do this, to save time. Now I'm going to draw this instead. And the front of that egg, front bottom of that egg, will be somewhere around the eye line. Eye socket, usually not right at the eye line, but at the eye socket, eyebrow, depending on how deeply in perspective it is. But now we're just stacking. I'm drawing the egg of the skull now I'm going to put on my T and oftentimes even my, my L there, L and the T. If I don't, sometimes I'll, you'll end up doing this. It'll look like an alien where the back of the skull lifts up too, too far. And again, compare it to the grid. That's pretty vertical really going back even a little bit. This is dropping down a little bit. The eye sockets are in here. And now I can build on that mask of the face. Let's just do this. And you'll notice that the ear oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes sits around the bottom of that egg. Notice when we're at a profile, it doesn't. But as we get on top, then whatever you draw that egg oftentimes tracks the eyebrow line or the eye line pretty well, the egg pretty well. Now it's tempting to do this then with your eyebrow line, but you'll, we need kind of a flattening of the face. If you look at it in deep perspective, you'll notice it falls back somewhat, but there's still a strong corner here. This dives back quickly. If we round that off, we're rounding off that corner and it distorts. And we can see that corner. It's a slightly rounded box. See that corner on uh, Ajax, or my not very heroic friend here. A little bit of curvature to that T, but there's a deep sense of the sides at the corners of the eye socket, shooting strongly back. And then the only danger here is if you don't get that nice strong T and make it a T, it can be a slightly curved T, but make it a T and not like that around the ball. Make it slightly boxy in other words. Notice that if I focus on the curve too much, dramatic pause here. If I focus on the curve too much, I can distort it. So I want that to be slightly curved or and or straight or quite straight, whatever, in there. And then notice how that allows me to correct 
Now, a lot of you probably saw that mistake. But we want these to do that, including the front of the nose. So it allows us to make those corrections. And to make sure they're tracking. And I'll oftentimes make those much longer because if I make them short, I might miss the fact that they're skewed, <clears throat> skewed somehow. So see how that works, how we do it on time. Let's get you out of here. Let's save that for next time. And uh, do that so we get a little more space. So if we look at this gentleman here, and what's great is when they've got a nice hairstyle and these slickly parted, you know, kind of 30s, 1880s to 30s folk, a nice part, that gives us that T of that L, that first L down here. So there's my egg. And then I'll usually come back and I will correct that and make that a little square. And I will also oftentimes make the hairline, in this case, he's got the sweeping bangs to the side, but make the hairline also straight or slightly curved anywhere in there and also the back side so i'm setting up my box logic now i'm starting to get that sense of the box in a certain perspective super helpful and then we've got all this other stuff going on here. And now I'm just gonna do the overlaps. I'm gonna overlap the eye sockets, even though they're negative balls. I'll attach, but overlap the nose, making sure it's tracking. And then the mouth, lips or barrel, chin, and so on. You can also just take, once you're feeling pretty good about the proportions, you can just take the whole face mask. There's that ear. I make a habit of drawing that ear and give the thickness of it on top of it, slightly in front of it. So I'm going to see that rim of the ear be on top, the thickness on top is slightly in front, although it poops out there and fades into the cheek and the sideburn area. And then I can track these things, come back to the chin, the nose, make sure they're tracking in position and proportion and so on. And then usually you got to do something about this because oftentimes this ends up here a little high, even high by my standards, certainly high by Loomis's standards. And so we need to adjust that a little bit. So then I refine it. Simple yet characteristic, nice and simple, but not quite as characteristic as it should or could be. Yeah, 
and I make those corrections. And so on. And notice how beautifully, not what we're talking about today, but notice how beautifully the uh, shadow patterns or the value patterns will usually track the corners where the front plane, front of the face meets the side of the face, front of the face is in shadow, or the top of the cheekbone, a little bit, or the top of the cheekbone meets the side of the cheekbone, shadow, where the front of the cheekbone slowly drops off into the front of the mouth area shadow and so on and so as we track this carefully we can then correct it proportionately position we can play with the character and we've got a roadmap now with a little bit of practice really more than a little bit of practice but we have a roadmap for our tonal map what's shadow what's light what's uh, dark light what's light shadow and working those things out so it becomes a, a wonderful tool to get it right uh, and pretty quickly, relatively quickly. Okay, I hope that uh, makes sense and helps. So, so we'll uh, <clears throat> we'll play with this next time as well. This was Lion Decker, by the way, early Lion Decker. Um, play with this this time, uh, next time as well, and see if we can't take it even farther to understand it even better and to have a ton of fun, hopefully, even more often.